So we're going to give you a, a duo. I will start and uh, Daniel will step in. So to give you a little bit of background, um, I'm going to uh, set the scene at the level of uh, cellular interactions. And you can see here that you have all sorts of uh, receptors, membrane proteins on the, uh, at the surface of cell. You have antibodies and you have those very interesting uh, little shapes here that are assembled together to uh, actually constitute glycans. And glycans decorate the surface of these proteins and glycans are actually also recognized whoops, by uh, a number of uh, other proteins like antibodies recognize glycan. And what we are going to focus on is those soluble, soluble so GVP means glycan binding proteins, which are otherwise called lectins. So, a lectin is actually a protein that has uh, at least one non-catalytic domain that binds to a specific. So you will see that I use glycans, I use oligosaccharides, I use sugars. These are all synonyms. And these are the, um, the, the sort of uh, representation, simplified representation. Otherwise, you have them like this. So the, you have a lot of uh, carbon rings uh, here. And this is just to simplify. And what is interesting is in these lectins, so these carbohydrate, uh, also another uh, synonym, uh, binding protein or glycan binding protein is that they are most of the time assembled in uh, multimers and uh, the multivalency of this protein is very important for glycan recognition. So this is just an example. And you can see, for instance, if I take a category like C-type lectins, they are usually assembled like a nice little bouquet here, or they are assembled with, uh, with different domains and uh, available here, etc. So C-type C means that they are actually binding calcium um, and recognizing uh, sugars, uh, glycans at the same time. So you see that there's a whole variety of these uh, proteins. And I, sorry for this not very good picture, but I did to illustrate the biological role, took uh, an excerpt of Laura Kisling, a talk she gave recently, and that was uh, a streamcast. So um, a person like this is never at its best. But anyway, she showed that, and this was very telling. She's a, a lectin specialist. So you can see the human lectins, you can map them uh, on the different tissues in the human body. And this is, uh, so there's a number of uh, papers showing that you can actually track the um, expression of some genes in different circumstances. So SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection, and you have here this interesting a lectin that is obviously uh, uh, under uh, overexpressed and of interest. And if you look at the um, Uniprot entry, so it will tell you that uh, this is a polymer surfactant associated protein D. And you can see down there that there is a, uh, it actually is part of the, uh, it's considered as a lectin, it's carbohydrate binding. And you can see that there's a cross-link to a database which is called Unilectin that we co-develop with a team in Grenoble. And you can actually see that this C-type lectin is, uh, well, you, you, you have all sorts of different information, its architecture and so on, and its biological role def defined in the number of publications. So we have, um, put together this Unilectin platform the, um, that is actually focused, that has different modules. The most um, uh, curated modules is the Unilectin 3D, so really based on the, the 3D shape of the lectins that are known. So we have um, also predictions 
with of beta propolis lectin, for instance, large scale uh, prediction, um, fungal uh, pro lectins also, and uh, beta uh, trefoil. And the idea is that we are trying to organize that information and structure that information and based on folds. So one of the big challenge with lectins is that they are not very well um, annotated uh, in, the, in databases. They're not very well characterized. They appear very often as uh, hypothetical proteins. And here the effort in unilectin 3D was was really to create a hierarchical um, classification based on fold and sequence similarity so that you could actually at least look at uh, different classes of lectins and their role is usually um, uh, related to their fold. So of course, they're different in different uh, organisms and what is interesting also, what would be interesting is to have a classification based on the molecules that they bind to. And this is a challenge and a challenge we are going to discuss further. So the first round of prediction we, we did with the Grenoble team was Lectome Explorer. So we actually, we have 35 fold 109 classes and 350 families. And we actually processed any sequence under the sun that we could find in Uniprot, that we could find at the NCBI, that we can found in proteome, um, I mean, translated genomes and so on. And we ended up with half a million lectins in uh, 17 plus uh, 100, uh, 000, uh, thousand species. And we are trying to make sense of this data. It's, it's hard, but uh, we, we try to use the classification to do so. And for instance, if you look at the human lectins, it's interesting to see that our prediction, the distribution in terms of classes is not what you find in Uniprot. So we, there's, a, there's a definite bias in Uniprot so that means in public databases in general towards C-type lectins, less with the I-type lectins, which are uh, some kind of immunoglobulin fold uh, lectins. And uh, we have this potentially artifact with ficolin-like lectins and so on. Uh, the galactin are about the same and, uh, and so on. So we have a greater variety in, in Lectome Explore and it needs to be uh, gone further. So what we need also to understand uh, what lectins are doing, so there's a, a lot of screening method. The, the functional uh, glycomics consortium was created at the beginning of the, uh, two, uh, of the 21st century, and they particularly accumulated data with glycan array. And a glycan array is simply synthetic molecules, so glycan molecules at the surface of the array, and you can test your lectins, your antibodies, your whole virus or some other um, modules, carbohydrate binding modules that exist. And there's accumulated data of glycan array that for the last 20 years have accumulated on that, uh, in that particular uh, platform. So to learn about that, I hand over to Daniel. Thanks, Mary. <laughs> Hi. Um, so what is our big picture here? So the idea is that both bacteria and viruses and many other proteins and organisms interact with glycans. So they use it in the case of bacteria and viruses, they use glycans as point of entry into cells. So critically important for infection for all kinds of pathologies. So wouldn't it be nice to have a model that tells you, given a protein sequence, given a glycan sequence, do they bind? Is there information in the sequence and potentially in the future also in the structure, et cetera, um, to make these kinds of predictions? So for that, I need to make a little bit of a circle um, of how, you, how do you do actually model building with glycans? But glycans are a biological sequence, of course, um, but they're not your typical biological sequence. So you may be used to rather things like that. So linear types of sequences, glycans are decidedly not linear. So they are, they have branches. They are the only biological sequence that uh, very commonly uh, just spots branches. 
However, if you rotate a glycan, and we are not the first to point this out, it looks very much like a tree, right? And trees are just special cases of graphs. And we have heard great things about graphs already, including their um, ability to be used for all kinds of fancy deep learning methods. Uh, so people in chemistry have realized that as well, of course, you can depict molecules, so chemical molecules as, as graphs at various levels of resolution. And you can use that for all kinds of um, property predictions with, for instance, graph neural networks. And you can do the same thing, of course, also for glycans um, in this case. So this is a, a deep learning um, graph neural network that uses these convolution operations to learn um, properties in glycans and that you can then connect to, to uh, maybe functions or other properties that these glycans have. So just one, one small example here, about a month ago, the, the first kidney transplants from pigs to humans um, have, been, have been performed. Uh, this is not with your typical pig, this is with the transgenic pig, because pig glycans are unlike human glycans, and therefore your immune system recognizes them. So you may, you may, you may remember what Perik pointed out, that antibodies bind glycans. So antibodies may bind these pig glycans. Transgenic pigs don't have these components anymore, and therefore you can more easily transfer their organs into our bodies. If you use a model to predict glycan immunogenicity, so this deep learning graph neural network, you apply that to pig glycans, which the model hasn't seen before. You can, you can score glycans based on likelihood of immunogenicity, and the predicted glycans that are immunogenic are among those that people have tried to modify via transgenic methods to get um, more uh, organs that are easier to transfer into humans. Going back to protein glycan interactions or lectin glycan interactions, um, this is a, a model where we use both information from glycans as well as information from proteins. And the module of glycans here is this same graph convolutional neural network, broadly speaking, that I've uh, showed you in the, in the last slide. Whereas for proteins, we use a large transformer-based model, so a, a language model type that has been pre-trained on, on, on a, lot, a lot of different protein sequences. And as input data here, we use the exact same glycan array data that Friedrich has, has, has spoken about before. So um, a large data set of probings between um, proteins and glycans, do they interact or not? So we have quite a, a bit of diversity as well as quantity here to uh, predict their binding um, and then hopefully uh, get some interesting results from that. Uh, so we did lots of things with that, which I can't go into all of them, unfortunately. Uh, but of course, we also validated our, our predictions with independent experimental data sets to show that we can generalize to new proteins, new glycans, and, and their presentation in, in different contexts, so different linkers, et cetera, um, as well as various uh, um, design parts on the protein sequence, but also um, maybe some, some indications that there may be some structural features that have been learned by the model. Uh, but I, 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 I just want to show two brief biological vignettes. So, and the first one is about um, bacteria. So the microbiome and the bacteria that constitute the microbiome, the biota, um, interact with glycans. So we thought, um, and Frederica has done previous work with, with that. So, so the, you know, this was, this was a really cool opportunity to look further at the vaginal microbiome, at uh, pathobionic and commensal strains of the vaginal microbiome, and find out which lectins do they have in their genome, and then use these sequences with lectin oracle to get binding predictions. And that's really cool because you can't do that currently. You can only, before lectin oracle, you can only work with proteins that have been either characterized before or at least have, have some kind of experimental data associated with that that you can mine. Whereas with our generalizable model, we don't need that. And using that, we, we can look at what do pathobionic strains find, what do commensal strains find, and what we find across the board is that patho pathobionic microbes in the vaginal microbiome are predicted to bind a greater diversity of glycan motifs, as well as more human-like glycan motifs, which potentially endows them with the ability to stick better to the mucosal surfaces and um, potentially lead to infection in some cases. The second example is with viruses. So uh, this is influenza virus. You may know that there are avian influenza virus strains and mammalian influenza virus strains. Uh, these are mainly, so of course there are many differences, but one very salient difference is the specificity of glycan binding. So as basically every virus, influenza virus binds glycan, it binds glycans via its hemagglutinin protein, which is on the, on the surface of the virus. And the avian, male, avian influenza virus binds um, this, this uh, diamond here, it's called salic acid, it binds it in a specific configuration, whereas the um, mammalian one binds it in a different configuration. Which leads, of course, to different geometry, a different structure, a different 3D structure, which um, can can endow these viruses with their specificity. 
No, you can go ahead and mutate the hemagglutinin of avian influenza virus. And in some cases, it's maybe sufficient to lead, it, lead the virus to infect mammalian hosts. So they have this zoonotic um, jump. And this premise that hemagglutinin sequence determines its binding specificity is exactly the premise that Vector Oracle was built on. So we thought we could maybe use that to have a second look at epidemiological data to see whether we can contribute anything from a glycol perspective. So what we did is we, we got strain data, so H3N2 influenza strain data from Taiwan for a given time period, uh, and predicted their binding of these strains to human glycans which fluctuates over time. So that is already one observation, and this uh, matches very well um, experimental data of these same strains. But what we did then is we, we took excess mortality data from H3N2 in Taiwan, same region, same virus, um, and overlaid that. And at least that gave us an indication that there could be a correlation between um, predicted binding to human glycans and the corresponding excess mortality of these viruses. So potentially, if they bind better to ourselves, it might be easier for them to infect us in greater numbers and therefore kill us um, better. And we are, we are currently further, further working on that uh, because we, we, we see trends that this generalizes to more cases. Um, before we end, I, I just want to, to, to thank uh, all the people here and our funding sources, but I'll turn it over to, to Federico for one, one last slide. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, this one is actually um, uh, related to classification. And this is where I said I was going to go back to that. And this is also uh, relating to Carsten's presentation where he says, well, after we've used the method, we have the challenge of it, interpreting the data. And this is exactly where we are too. Uh, you can see that if we, if we predict a lot of, uh, of results, then we have to make sense of them. And here is an example of uh, the uh, before and after uh, running the, the method, the, the model that was created uh, by uh, Daniel, and we are after training. Uh, this is the sequence classification uh, that we, with our different classes of, of lectins. And you can see that we sh change the landscape after training. So this is, of course, something we want to add to our uh, thinking about classifying lectins and putting them in, uh, I mean, relating their function, having more of a functional classification as opposed to structural as it is at the moment, try to see how the two overlap. And this is really the next step in, uh, in unilectin and uh, justifying even further, if it needed, our collaboration between our groups. So on my side, I want to thank uh, the Grenoble team for the work that was done and presented uh, between uh, Francois Bonardel, who was a PhD student, successfully finished, and Anna Berti, with whom I um, co-supervised the work. So, and thank my group, uh, the Proteome Informatics Group, which is a big 